coming. I'm Molly Sarbat, the Director of the Office of Postdoctoral Services. And I'd like to welcome you to the third panel discussion that we've held uh, in our series on the academic job search. This series is co-sponsored by the Duke Career Center and the Graduate School. And the previous two discussions were on the academic application process and the academic interview. If you didn't see those, you can find them online at the Duke Postdoc Services website where they're archived. And I doubt any of you are in the social sciences and humanities, but if you are, there is a parallel track of workshops for social sciences and humanities also on that website. And you can also find the schedule of upcoming events there. Our next discussion, which I think is next week, will be on non tenure track careers in academia. After that, we're having a um, panel discussion on careers in research administration, which is a very vague name that covers all kinds of interesting jobs. So I encourage you to come to both of those. Today's discussion is on negotiating the faculty job offer, aka show me the money and don't forget the benefits <coughs> of the parking space, very important at Duke. Um, many of you submitted your questions in advance, so thanks very much for doing that. We will start with those questions and then open the floor to <coughs> the audience. Um, I will ask that during the open discussion that you keep your questions general in nature. If you have a question that's very specific to your personal situation, we will stop at um, 10 minutes till so that you have a chance to come up and ask the panelists your specific question. And now I'd like to thank our panelists for taking time out of their very busy schedule for joining us today. We really appreciate you all sharing your time and advice with us. So our panelists are Kate Meyer, who is Assistant Professor of Biochemistry, Chris Nikita, who is Professor of Cell Biology and Associate Dean for Research Training, Jonathan Viventi, who is Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering, and John Willis, Professor of Biology. So I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves and briefly discuss how they've been involved um, in the negotiation process, either very recently as an applicant or as somebody who's been on the search committee. And then we'll get started with the questions. Okay, would you so, like to start? So, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate. Um, so I have actually been on both ends of, of that side very recently. So I started my lab here at Duke in September of 2016, so, you know, a year and a half ago <coughs> or so, which means about Two years ago, I was you know, going through the whole interview process, so it was still very fresh in my mind, very familiar. Um, and then this year, I'm on the faculty search committee for pharmacology and cancer biology. So like I said, I've gotten out to, to see the other end of, of that as well. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Chris Nikita. Um, I'm <coughs> relatively long in the tooth, so I've seen many of these, and including my own, obviously, but that was too distant, I think, to be terribly relevant. I've been on a number of search committees in a number of different departments. And I also, myself, went through a sort of mid-career, um, an opportunity at NIH, where I went through extensive negotiations, but decided that the position here was, was superior. So. In addition to that, sort of in my role in the dean's office, we get to see some of the inside discussions about the negotiation process. So I'm happy to help you with all of that. Great. I'm John Metti. Um, I've been through the negotiation process now twice. I started my lab at NYU in 2011, and then uh, was recruited to move here in, uh, three years ago, 2015. Uh, and so I went through the whole negotiating and sort of thing all over again. And, uh, yeah. and then I've been on a few search committees, so Sides. I'm John Willis uh, in biology. Um, I'm very long in the tooth, and so it's been a while since I moved here in 2000 after being a professor and a faculty member at the University of Oregon for about seven or eight years. So it's been a while since I personally have negotiated, but of course I've helped lots of folks in lab um, as they've gone on to negotiate jobs. I've been on search committees and um, generally been involved in, in lots of recruitment here at Duke, so happy to give you my two cents for it. Thank you. Um, could you talk about when and how the negotiation process typically starts? Do you start in person at the first campus interview, second campus interview, or does the chair of the search committee call you afterwards? How does it usually go down? For me, it started um, usually second visits is when you would kind of start to talk about more of the details of the job. Because that's, that's, of course, when you know, they're, the school is essentially showing their interest in you and, and saying, you know, it, there are some exceptions, exceptions, but by and large, if you're coming back for a second visit, it means 
they intend to make you an offer. And so usually that happens at some point, there will be a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you and the chair of the department, um, at which point you'll sit down and discuss kind of the details of, you know, things like salary and, you know, tenure process and teaching load and lab space and all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, you kind of discuss, you know, what the parameters of an offer might look like shortly thereafter you get one. I think, okay, well, actually, just one brief comment on that. And I think that one of the best things you can do is talk to someone like Kate. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, John. Jonathan. Um, people that have recently gone through the process, being prepared. If you get if you get the call for the second interview, you've made the short list. So they're very serious and they're very interested in you. They're interested in you, your research. They see you as a good fit in, in their department, in, in their university. And so if you have some sense, and I think the preparation on your part is really important, think about what you need, think about what year one, year two, year five, you're thinking about the tenure process, do, a little, do your homework, look at the tenure clock at the university that's considering you. So come in with a working knowledge of the negotiation process and also some knowledge about the institution itself and so that you can be a more active participant in the process. And when you begin the, the negotiation, you know, as Kate said, don't, don't be a sort of a rough framework at that second meeting. And the more you know, the better off you are. Yeah, that's a good point. Because you don't want to miss out on that opportunity to ask questions, too. Um, so coming in, you know, being educated on, on the individual institution as well as things that are important to you, um, will, will help you out a lot. And another thing I should mention too is around that time they will ask you for a list of your startup needs, um, which is another thing that you want to, you know, not save for the last minute. Um, you know, I remember when I was interviewing, at, you know, at different places, I would kind of in the background be making my running list of all the equipment, all the reagents, all the major things that you think you would need to run your research program, even if it's something that, well, maybe this is for an experiment, a piece of equipment for an experiment that I, I might do, but it's not gonna be in the things I discuss in my job talk or my talk talk, that's okay, put it on the list. If you think you if you think you might need it, that means you can justify it and, and you wanna make sure you have all that on your on your startup list. So that's another thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind is, you know, making a running list of all the things you think that you would need for your, for your research program. Yeah, I think in our department we've uh, been asking for a list of startup requests um, at the first interview even. So even before we're sort of considering an offer and uh, getting a short list of what it is you might be interested in. So start compiling that list. Um, think about that as what you would need to run your lab for three years. Um, and sort of the actions of other funding uh, of all the supplies, uh, support for students, things like that. Get a rough idea, but then Negotiation obviously goes from there. I don't have much to add to that. I think um, I think it's unusual to have um, you know a, a request for um, your startup in the first interview. I mean, I think it's much more typical. Um, you know, once you are the candidate of choice, and um, at that stage, yeah, I think it's pretty typical. The other thing is um, think a lot about facilities. Some, some of you may have special needs in terms of, um, you know, mouse, you know, facilities, or in my case it was greenhouses, and, you know, I really couldn't do my research, I work on plants, and I really couldn't do my research if I didn't have a decent greenhouse. And so that, um, you know, those kinds of uh, needs beyond sort of equipment, beyond reagents, beyond personnel, um, are really important to have in mind early on. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about the um, startup package? You know, we hear startup package, we hear startup money. It's like, oh, is that money that I can keep, get to keep forever, or does it go away? Um, how can you determine like what a good startup should be? I mean, I think if you get an offer you know, you should certainly consult with your PI. Hopefully you're doing that throughout this process. Um, but, you know, there are others available. Everyone, I think, on this panel, I would certainly be happy to, to look at someone's startup offer if they wanted advice on whether, you know, it was competitive. But, you know, talking to your PI, I think, would be would be really helpful in that regard. Um, and, yeah. 
you know, it's it's tough to it, it all depends too. If you're if you're applying for you know a place like Duke, that that might be a different startup package than what you might get offered from you know a small teaching university, for instance. So um, there will be some differences there. Um, but I, I think just if you get to that stage, you know, reach out. Don't 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 do everything in isolation. Talk to your PI most importantly. Um, talk to maybe other colleagues you might have, might know that have gone through the process recently. Um, talk to other faculty that have gone through the process recently. We're happy to help. It's in a way, it's a very unusual job interview and job transition. It's nothing we've ever done before. Okay. We've had other jobs, and it was very straightforward. And this is this very peculiar thing where you, you're getting recruited to a position or interviewed for a position, and the expectation is you've envisioned the next three to five, six years of your research. You've relatively accurately assessed what you need. Um, you understand university politics, university promotions, university salary structures. You understand benefits packages. Well, of course you don't. You've never, you've never <laughs> done it before. So reaching out to your PI and working through the process with them, or junior faculty in particular who've recently gone through it. That's probably and, better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, depending on your PI, we may be this really is out of date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, 50,000 is yeah. really good. <laughs> <laughs> They're offered a 20,000. <laughs> <laughs> So, the, so think about that and, and get the advice because there's, there's no place you can go on the web that's going to say, here's what a package should look like. Every university is different. Promotion policies are different. It's a very diverse landscape. And the, the thing I would say, if there's one take-home point that I would love you to take, take away with is if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. So don't say, well, I don't want to ask for it because they're not going to make me an offer if I ask for this. That's not true. The, the search process is very expensive. Um, time and money of bringing people in and the whole process is extensive and departments want it to work. They've selected, you always get a very good pool of applicants. You've made that cut and they want the process to work. They want a successful search. So they're very engaged in a successful outcome. So don't be shy about asking. Yeah, I would say that what you just said is one of the least appreciated aspects of a job search. I mean, you're all viewing it from the job applicant, but you probably have no clue as to how long it's taken to get this job search approved in the first place. It's taken years of intense faculty <coughs> meetings and negotiations with the deans and stuff to even get permission to search in this particular area. They have, the search committee has worked incredibly hard to, you know, pick out the best candidates. And so I know that you guys are thinking of it from your perspective, which is great, but um, really realize that you're not in an adversarial position with the faculty. The faculty are there to make sure that it works. They want it to work. They want to work with you to make sure that you will come, number one, so it won't be a wasted search and number two, that you will succeed and thrive. The, the last thing anyone wants is to nickel and dime you and um, make it so that you A, won't come, or B, won't succeed. So I, I think often, you know, you kind of view it as like, oh, I've got to really fight with the administration. This is the only chance in my life to get stuff. But really uh, realize that they have no interest in lowballing or nickel and diming. Like, they really want you to come. They really want you to do well. So, um, yeah, and the way to realize that is that these, the whole department has worked years to get to this stage, I would say. I think there was a point in there about um, your startup expiring, and so this is sort of a variable negotiable thing where a lot of places want to put an expiration date on your startup. Um, but I think they don't want an unfounded liability across many years, and they also want you to spend it, so they don't want you to hoard your money so that you have this rainy day fund, but then you don't invest in your own research. But at the same time, your desire is also, I should save some of this money and try to have discretionary funds, because that is the lifeblood of actually getting anything done and running your lab. Uh, so there is a trade-off. You need to spend enough so you get things off the ground, you get startup, uh, you get pilot data, 
you're able to apply for grants, and then once you have enough grants to run everything, then you transition everything off the startup and try to conserve it as much as possible, and try to get it to last so you can you know, continue to fund travel and student support and all sorts of other weird things that you can't charge to grants and cleaning supplies and all sorts of you know, surgical equipment, all this nonsense we can't charge to grants. And I think, in my experience, at least most places, you know, your startup was, was bankable, they would often call it, or, you know, essentially it, it wouldn't expire. But it was a point that was brought up in pretty much every conversation that I had of all the places I interviewed. So it, it is important to, to, you know, make sure that is the case, because there are some places that, you know, will set an expiration date, like you said, because they want to incentivize you to spend. They don't want you hoarding your money. So it's, it's just something to make a note of when you get to those conversations, usually with the chair. Um, you know, make sure you, you you talk about that. You could ask for a part of it to not expire, not your entire thing. You know, not to say you, know, you keep your entire thing, but you can have a portion of it after your first four years. Your first four years. Thank you. Nobody ever got tenure for not spending their startup. <laughs> There's no reward for it. Put it to use. But as uh, Jonathan said, is try to envision having that money that you know you can't cover in other ways, and that you want to protect because you will need that at some point, and we'll be glad you have it. Could you talk a little bit about the differences in negotiating if, uh, for a job in a school of medicine versus arts and sciences versus? A school of engineering. I think a lot of postdocs and students may not realize that there are big differences there. Like, you know, teaching load is a very obvious one. So, could you talk a little bit about that? Am I the only arts and sorry? You? Yeah, I'm your arts and sciences. So, obviously, teaching is is a big component. The other thing is that um, we're on typically nine month salaries, which could be different in medical center or whatever. Um, so, yeah, the one thing is um, it's very common for incoming faculty to have negotiated summer salary for the first couple of years or whatever, or have it be sort of backstop so that as, as long as they apply for grants and write in their summer salary um, in their grants, and if they don't get the grants, the university would backstop them the summer salary at least for the first couple of years. Um, I don't know what the issues are with salary in, in Med Center, but um, yeah, the, each, each school has its own unique kind of combination of things. So Med Center, you're on a 12-month calendar? There is no utopia, so, so <laughs> everything has, has pros and cons. And so you have a 12-month 12 um, salary window Generally, in medical school systems, the expectations for salary recovery on grants is much higher. Um, but as a, but the payoff to that is your teaching load is low. So it's just a matter of where you see yourself professionally. Um, if, if you're passionate about teaching and, and that component of education and want that as, a, as an integral part of your job, I mean, I would align with, with who you are and what you love to do. Um, I would say the teaching expectations are lower, but generally grant recovery expectations are higher, both for salary and there's this magic funny formula of IDC per square foot, indirect cost recovery per square foot. There's somebody in some deep bowels of the university system that knows exactly how many square foot your, your lab space, your research space occupies. And they're looking at the indirect costs that you bring in in your grants per square foot and they have a magic number that they like to see. Yeah. So you'll get pressure at some point about overall indirect cost return. But again, it, there, there's, there's no utopia. There's benefits to both sides. And a lot of it is how you see yourself in your research program and where you'll flourish. And these are good things, again, to bring up when you're having that conversation, usually second visit, you know, with the chair, because for, for medical center departments, you know, it did, it does vary. It's not like there's a set, you know, salary that they want you to recover at every place. It is different from place to place. So, you know, it's important to understand what, what the policies within that department are, and then even from one department to another, it might differ within the same university, the same medical center. So, it's important to talk about that with the chair and, and make sure you understand, you know, what the expectations are. 
and in, in engineering schools, it's typically nine month salary, academic salary, and then your request for fire training, your three month salary. Um, I guess in some places it's been there. It just you just get a pot of money, and you can use that to support your summer salary if you need to. Um, if you don't have a grant to support it, you can use it for students. You can use it for equipment. It's some of them. I think some of the offers are a little more generic, where it's here's a big pot of money, and you need to do whatever you need to do. How much detail does a job offer letter typically go into it? Does it say like you will have a thousand square feet in the Jones building, and I will get three computers, or? And six mice, or, or, or six mice. Yeah. I would have no use for those. <laughs> <laughs> or how much did you ask for if you are, you know, negotiating? You, I mean, in, in my experience, most of the kind of first pass offer letters went into detail on the, you know, the really important stuff. So yes to, you know, square footage of your office and building that it was located in and all that stuff. Um, obviously the salary, you know, what you'd be paid um, and how the salary structure is in terms of what you're expected to, to come up with. Um, and, you know, things like uh, your, your tenure clock are, are laid out in the letter, what the tenure process will be. Um, <coughs> as well as, you know, I think it, it kind of varied. If, if there are big equipment items that you might need, that might be in the letter. Um, otherwise, you know, when you give your startup list, it's not like that's all going to make it into the letter. We're not going to say, you know, one cryostat and one, you know, microtome or, you know, it's, but they will lay out what your startup package will be. So, you know, X dollars to cover, you know, startup costs and then it'll, it'll detail, you know, how much of that includes your salary, how much of that includes X, Y, Z. Um, and, you know, you can, when you're negotiating then, you'll get your first offer letter and, you know, you can come back and, and if there are things that are important to you that you want to have in your letter, make sure they're in the letter because, by the way, you can never, no matter how nice someone seems, you can never take his or her word that that's going to be the case moving forward. You know, a, a chair could step down and be replaced by someone else and they say, well, I didn't promise you this. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not in your offer letter. So make sure the really important stuff is in your offer letter. Um, yeah. It's really good advice. Try to anticipate what you're going to need. Look at the core resources, internal resources that are available. Um, think about budgeting your startup costs and needs based on resources you have. Because you might be thinking, oh wow, I'd love to have my own confocal. But if there's six confocals in the department and you insist on having your own, you're also taking on the cost of maintaining that confocal yeah. and the service contracts. Bad. And you're going to bleed money very quickly. So think about what resources can I leverage to support my program. And this is something where you could negotiate and say, well, I need a guarantee of X percent of hours or on a particular piece of equipment. And if I can't get that, then I'm going to need this. So just try to think about, imagine yourself in your lab with a couple students and a technician and you're getting started, your goal is to get that first major grant, what do you need to get there, and how can you best channel and leverage your resources to get to that place? Yeah, I guess I would just add to that, um, often, yeah, I would take advantage of shared facilities, maybe you could include in your startup something that would add to those shared facilities, <coughs> that, you know, pieces of equipment that you would especially like to have uh, access to, but the last thing you want to do is be saddled with service contracts on, you know, huge items that you're going to be using once a month or something. Um, and really talk with the chair. Oftentimes things that you'll want that may be somewhat tangential that, you know, you would not want to have responsibility for in your own lab, but boy, you would really make use of it if you had it, might be a piece of equipment or something that other folks in the department would also really like to have access to. And sometimes you can be the catalyst for getting a source of money from the administration or something to build up that, that core facility to the, you know, standards that you would want without it really impacting your startup directly. And then it's a win-win situation because the whole department will be thrilled you're coming not only because of who you are, but also because you're like improving the facilities for everyone. 
and um, and it's you know no skin off your back because it's not really coming out of your startup. Um, so yeah, is this just goes back to what I was trying to say earlier? Is really try to see how you could work with um, the administration of the chair so that it's a win-win situation for the department as well as for you. Um, and often there are things like that where you can um, say, oh, I, I understand you're going to be renovating the greenhouses. I'd really love it if there were these nice lights and they, other folks would say, wow, I never really thought of that. I could grow my plants year-round and it would be awesome. So, yeah, let's just do it. And then it's not off your startup. And going back to something Chris said earlier, you know, you're, you're not going to get things that you don't ask for. So, of course, these are people that might be your future colleagues. So you don't want to just approach it as, oh, I'm just going to bleed them dry and get everything I can. You know, as long as you can justify everything and it, it is something that you really would need to support your, your research program, it's fine. You know, ask for it. And you might not, you're not going to get every single thing you ask for, but, you know, maybe it'll lead to other opportunities where, you know, new equipment could come into the department or things like that. Um, so, you know, if you don't ask for it, then you know you can't get it, and it, as long as it's justifiable, it, it doesn't hurt. And same goes for salary. You know, every offer I had, I always asked for more salary, because guess what? They're not going to give you more if you don't ask for it. Again, you're not asking for, you know, you know, double what they offered you, but, you know, it's it's not unreasonable to ask for 10000 more, let's say, from what they offered, you know, depending. Um, and you know, usually they'll you'll meet somewhere in the middle, and that's that's more money in your pocket. So, so you can ask for um, just back to that start sorry into it. You can ask for things that are not necessarily money. I mean, you can focus on the startup number, the cash pile, and you know your your, your salary. Those two big things. But you can try to ask for things that are not necessarily money, like you know, so so many hours of support of uh, in kind support, say you know, time in the clean room that that's paid for, or MRI time, or things that are core facility charges that aren't really, you know, Duke internal money money, so it's not like cash in a, in a <coughs> And you can even get creative and ask for things like backstopping on a collaborative proposal, or, um, you know, equipment matching funds. Um, but you do need to, I guess this lesson I just learned, is that the, even the things that are in your letter are not really guaranteed in that the dean turns over, the chair turns over, and then they, the new people feel no obligation to honor what's in your letter, so they can kind of throw that out the window. So the things that you do get in your startup, at least, you know, the, the account shows up when you first show up and it's there, and no one really gets into that and takes it. And your salary stays the same, but all the other creative things could disappear, so don't bank on them. Questions? It sounds like it's a probably it's a good advice rather than talk to other PIs outside of the institution. Talk to junior faculty to at the place you're going, because they just went through the process at that same department, and they'll know what is it that people want, so that you can negotiate in the corner. <coughs> sort of. I mean, their interests are aligned with yours, right? It'd be okay to talk to. People yeah, I think you yeah, can absolutely. kind of feel that situation out. I had places where I interviewed where. There were just a couple junior faculty that I got along with. You know, they were always at the dinners, or you know, we just, or they they had been recruited the year or two before, so it was fresh in their mind too, and they were very eager to help. Um, so I think you can kind of feel that out. And, and there were cases like that where they would even say to me, they said, "Look, you know, these offers can be kind of complicated. Or there's other stuff that you can ask for that they won't really tell you about. You can ask for, and you know, let me email you or let's chat later, and, and we can talk about it." So. So absolutely, that's that's a good resource too. Yeah, there's never any harm to seeking advice from as many people as possible, and some of it you'll find useful, and some of it you won't. So you know, if there's a new hire who really is uh, upset because they didn't negotiate very aggressively or very I don't, I don't want to use the word aggressively, but they didn't uh, get all the stuff that they wanted then you don't want to be turned off necessarily by them. Um, you can sort of learn from their experience and you know, build on that. So just you could usually get some great information even from people who are, um, you know, you wouldn't want to exactly duplicate what they did. What about grants? I, I know a lot of postdocs feel angst about like, oh, if I can't show that I had an F31 or an F32 or if I don't have a K99, I'm, I'm not going to get an offer. Do you, do you 
how do you feel about coming in with grants? If you have them, great, but they're they're not higher in the grade. See, don't we all feel better now? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it. Yeah, it makes a huge um, difference. It's nice to show that you can get funds on your own, that you can get research dollars, but that has not. We've had candidates that I thought were great that had K99s that didn't even get interviewed, and then people who don't have any grants at all get get interviews where I think it's really about the quality of your research. It's expected that once you arrive, you'll use your startup, you'll generate preliminary data, you'll be able to apply for grants, you'll get funding. I think it's more about the caliber of your research and your papers, and that really helps you get the job. Yeah, and really it's about future <coughs> prospects. So I think we talked about this in a couple of the earlier um, <coughs> sessions uh, about interviews and stuff like that. You know, you're, when you're at the interview stage, um, there they brought you in because of your track record, right? But really the decision on hiring is going to be much, much, much more about your future prospects. Do you have a research trajectory that they can easily envision where you're just going to go, you know, then that's what's going to get you hired. It's not your past accomplishments. I mean, those are sometimes indicative, but they could also be, oh, you're a postdoc in a lab where that's just normal. You know, it's just, they're, they're going to be um, much more interested in what you're going to do once you get to the institution, not what you're going to bring to the institution from a previous grant or something like that. Right. Yeah, and if you don't have a stellar funding record, you know, who cares? Wild them with your written proposal. You know, that's what, that's really what's going to, I mean, the you on paper is what's going to get you an interview. And once you get the interview, <coughs> You know, they're not thinking about, oh, well, this person had a K99 and this one didn't. No, you're going to come and hopefully wow them with your presentation and in the chop talk about all your plans for your future research. And like you said, that's what's really going to get get you a job is people are going to be excited about where you're going, not what you've done. So, you know, don't fret if you don't have a K99 or whatever. It, it's it's okay. You know, wow them with with your proposal and with, with your written plans, and then hopefully when you get come for an interview, wow them again with you know being able to talk about all that. Let's just, yeah, say just one quick thing. Is I, would, I would personally be a little concerned about an institution that had yeah. expectations and everybody wanted that, because that tells me that they're on shaky, backs. Their, their funding op mechanisms are shaky. And so they're looking to minimize their financial exposure, which means they don't have financial exposure to gamble with. And I would take that more as a red flag, that they're not confident in their decision making, they don't have the funds to build, yeah. they're not looking at the future of the department of research programs, but they're trying to be very accounting and short, short term. Penny pinching. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that would work. Mm -hmm. That would continue. <clears throat> Me too, yeah. <clears throat> I was gonna ask, is that um, field specific then? Because like, in, at least in my world of geriatrics, it seems like it's very, um, that's like the number one thing in all the job positions, like highly desirable to have uh, funding, you know. So, yeah. is, so is that a difference between the way, like the letters in your field are written, the job, you know, like the, the position, the advertising? Why are they asking that? Like I what? Know, I, what I they came want? to find out. <laughs> <laughs> like, how long would that funding last? Exactly. Like well, seriously, like, like I don't know about four, these. Yeah, like three to five years. Yeah, and how long could your position last at that institution? <laughs> Hopefully, forty years. <laughs> yeah. So, what does that have to do with anything? Nothing, except maybe an indicator of your future potential. But yeah, so I guess that I think that. That's a red flag, I think. Yeah, but that's what, I mean, it, was, it sounds to me like you're, I mean, maybe it's because it's two such different worlds. I mean, like our that, geriatric like, department short-lived, sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, are, are these in, is it in the clinical department? Yeah, so clinical departments, and that's not something we haven't talked about. So. Both departments are different. The promotion process is different. The structure of the departments are different because many of the faculty are actually generating revenue right. through their clinical component. So I would say 
we should have someone from a PhD in the clinical department speak speak with you because it's very very different. And you know, Deb Silver, hmm? yeah, speak would, to Deb Silver. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if a clinical department would say something like that because they're extremely cost driven. Yeah. And they're looking at it at three months, six months, and this. But that's the financial model of how clinical departments operate. And they are very, very different from academic departments in both schools of medicine and arts and sciences. So, okay. yeah, it can, can be a challenge to be a PhD in a clinical department. If your colleagues are all <coughs> MDs, then you know, this happens in neurology and other places that I work with where. If your grant funding dips, then you immediately go back to seeing patients, and your salary is still covered, and things are fine. But if you're in the PhD and you don't see patients, then you're you're just out. So you know your salary goes to zero. And so it can be a trade-off to, to be uh, aware of when you're considering a clinical department versus an academic department on fields that in fields that can have both places. Well, you shift gears a little bit and talk about what if you have a partner or spouse? What do you do then? When do you bring that up? Can you negotiate a position for him or her? Do you leave it till the last minute and say, surprise? <laughs> or, um, yeah, no, I think it's helpful to bring that up early. Um, it's hard to know exactly when is the right time to bring it up. Usually someone will be nice and ask about it, or I can't really ask, but we'll try to ask. Um, I guess you can. You can ask if there's anyone else we should be considering. You can't say it. But, um, and I, I think in some places actually handle this really well. I was on one interview where they actually handed me, you know, this the pamphlet and all about they have a centralized office of partner searches and they uh, handle it at the, at the school level, sort of away from the departments, and so they can help negotiate. Um, so I think just having that in mind helps because sometimes that process to identify opportunities for your partner can take a long time and so if you bring it up on the second or third visit it, it might take a while for them to actually set the wheels in motion talk to the other departments and facilitate something versus having that discussion as early as reasonable maybe the first visit um, can at least have them that in their minds so they can they can call their colleagues and figure out who would be the right connection yeah I mean I think like you said, they're not really supposed to ask you about that, but I think pretty much every place kind of did in a roundabout way, something like, oh, is there anyone else you should consider? And for the record, you don't have to answer that, you know, because they're technically not supposed to ask, but really it benefits you because, you know, the sooner they're aware of, of your situation, you know, the, the, fact, the longer time there is for them to maybe help you out. Um, so usually I, I try to bring it up as, as soon as as soon as you know possible um, and yeah it really varies some places you know they they weren't very active about trying to do things in other places they were in some places like Duke actually has a dual career services offices they were office they were very helpful for us um, so again it's it's up to you I I I found personally it was better to just bring it up sooner rather than later um, and you know I think people worry that oh that's that's going to be a mark against you, you know, if you have a spouse that, that needs to make the move as well. And it's not, you know, like, like Chris was saying, there's so much invested in these searches and they want it to work. And if you're their top choice, they will do what they can to bring you here. And they rec recognize it's not just you sometimes, it's you and your family. So, um, you know, don't don't think of it as, oh gosh, this is just going to be a mark against me. It's, it's just one more factor, you know, like all the recruits, there's, you know, we're scientists, but, you know, you also have a life too. and and the environment you're coming to is, is a big deal, right? It's a major life change, potentially for, for the rest of your life. And, and search committees know that, so they want to do what they can to, to make sure you're going to be happy if you come here. Yes. What if you get really, really lucky and you have more than one offer? How do you... Use them. Yeah. Use them. So you can tell one school, hey, these other guys are offering. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yep. Do you play poker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the ideal situation. If you have multiple offers, you can, you know, again, keep in mind these are going to be your one of one place will be your future colleague. So you don't ever want to come off as shrewd and just grabbing for the, you know, biggest pot of money you can get or something like that. But use it to your advantage. Not everyone gets multiple offers, so that's a unique position. Um, 
absolutely say, you know, and I, I would say things like, well, you know, X, Y, and Z is, is able to offer this, you know, is there any way that, that you guys could maybe match that? Um, you know, you, again, you want to think carefully about how you <coughs> phrase such things, but often those will come in, you know, phone conversations with, with the chair. Um, and then they would come back and they would go up the, up the ladder, up the chain, and, and have their conversations, and get new letters signed off on, and then come back with a revised letter. And it's not uncommon for, for faculty candidates to have multiple offers. So you want to think about it in terms of just some basics of negotiation. So if, you're, if you have, let's say, two offers, you have to be willing to walk away from one of them. Mm -hmm. right. so, if, you, if there's a place that offers you that you're really not seriously considering, so think about that in your strategy. How, how hard do you want to push this offer if you're not willing to? Yeah, it's just it's just <coughs> some basics of negotiation. And, and being, um, to me, sort of realistic about what you want. As, as Kate said, it's not a matter of how high I can push the, the dollar figure. Um, but use it, you definitely should use it to your advantage and say, well, I, I have a competing offer and they've been much more generous about equipment or startup or student support or they've offered this. And that's important to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, you want to, that's, that's important. saying what's important and they're doing something that is important to me and therefore is going to influence my decision. If they're giving you a year's supply of M&Ms you know, <laughs> and you hate sweets, you're not going to say, you know, they're giving me M&M's, <laughs> step up your game. And, um, yeah, and then you're just stuck with all of these M&M's. <laughs> yeah, so exactly, I mean, think about, it always comes back down to they're hiring you because they're interested in you as a colleague, your research, how your research will impact the lab, or that a larger scale from higher administration, how that improves the sort of portfolio of basic sciences or <coughs> translate whatever it is that you're doing at their university. And so they're really interested in making this happen. And you always want to be asking, you know, where am I gonna, with the four to seven year window, where am I gonna go? That gives me, give me the best opportunity to establish my research program and do what I love to do. And that's why you're going on a job search because you want to you love this career and you want to keep doing it. So don't don't burn up um, time and collegiality and yeah. your relationships with your faculty and your chair for a couple of thousand dollars. But in the same breath, don't not ask. Right. You can always ask, even if you only have one offer, you can ask for more salary and more startup. Um, and I might even preference asking, focusing on the salary piece more, because I don't think you get another chance to negotiate that ever. It's you, you're going to get tiny raises every year based on whatever whims of the dean and the average of the university. Um, and start, you, know, you can always generate more research money. You can rent more grants, you get more money. That's easy to fix, but you can never change your Super easy. <laughs> <laughs> Not that easy, but <laughs> easier. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, we're all going to be super lucky and get more than one offer, right? Right. Positive thinking. How much time can you ask for? <clears throat> to to make a decision. Right. Mm -hmm. To make a decision. Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty variable. There are some places that, that don't put a, a time stamp on it because they say we know these are complicated decisions, just you know, let us know when you can. And then there are others that would put you know, a two or three week deadline. But you can almost always push the deadline. I mean, my offer here, I think I pushed the deadline a couple times. Um, just because the timing never, is never going to work perfectly, right? You, know, you might have an offer from one place, but maybe you even have another visit to go on for another place. Um, so you're not going to get an offer until a few weeks later when this first offer might expire. So they recognize that. You know, they of course want to incentivize you to make a decision, but I'd be a little bit suspect of a place that refused to extend a deadline at least one time. You know, I, you, know you, you have to recognize that schools have their own internal deadlines, decisions need to be made, you know, by certain periods to, to set the budget and things like that. But most schools should be sensitive to, to this whole process and understand that the timing's not going to be perfect. 
you don't want to just be sitting on an offer for no reason. But um, yeah, usually if if you ask, you can extend the deadline at least once. If you have a valid reason, sure, right. no problem. I mean, it, it also can get annoying that we've had people that have drawn out their offer for a year with no good reason, and we're just like, what? What's going on here? Like what? Yeah. You know, and that just annoys everyone in the department. So if they did ever show up, we would. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's typical that uh, places like Duke, who um, you know have a relatively easy time convincing people to come here. Um, will be much more willing to extend the deadline. Whereas smaller schools that are competing against uh, larger institutions with deeper pockets <coughs> have probably been burned many times. Where you know they have done this whole thing like years, three years, trying to convince the dean to authorize the search. They go through all of this work. They come up with their top choice their top choice then drags it out and then bags on them and, le and leaves them in the lurch and it's already too late because their second and third choice have already gotten offers elsewhere and have gone and they have to start the whole process up all over again and maybe at that point the money's dried up and so I mean you know think of it from their perspective too obviously your, per your own personal thing is the most important thing but if you're just extending it because you want to use them as leverage uh, to get more resources at the place you really want to go to, but it's a subtle amount that you want to use, you know get and you know sort of weigh those things. I mean, you don't want to piss off the whole country, and, you know, and, and just so that you get your ideal dream job. And people have long memories. You know, they think, like, what a jerk. <laughs> yeah. And the ideal dream job looks great from a distance, and then when you're there, the ideal dream job looks like someplace else. Yeah. It's there, all the no, brown M&Ms only. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, on that note, we said we'd stop at 10 till, so we'll do that if you'd like to come down and ask some questions and have another <coughs> pastry and some coffee. And let's thank our panel.